Thank you, Loretta, for your wonderful words. Thank you to Daniel also. A great honor for me to be invited here and to moderate this high profile panel. Um, why me? I, I didn't understand that really from the beginning. So um, I was thinking a little bit, and then I thought we are such good friends. So um, you know, like very few people, about my real passions and sometimes obsessions, I think. Uh, and I will um, start with a very tiny, short little story. Uh, I used, I mean, I was a pioneer, and uh, a pioneer opening um, the first, the only, and the last foreign gallery in Russia. Um, you don't get famous with that, I can tell you. But uh, <laughs> um, you get wise a little bit, or let's say wiser, and um, you collect a lot of experience. And um, I learned one um, beautiful word in Russia. It was um, invented by Dostoevsky in the 19th century, and it's Stushevatze. Nobody, I'm sure, he knows. Maybe Matthew knows. He lived in Matthew Stevenson. He represented Christus in London, he's here. Maybe he knows the word. Um, it's a beautiful word because you can't translate it into any other language. You can describe it. And um, it's very much about the way I think and I work and I live and I deal with art. The translation would be like making yourself invisible or being modest or trying to even to disappear. Something which I was always interested in. I like quiet side streets more than main loud roads. I like small, beautiful, less known museums or galleries. I like to visit them. Sometimes for me, a small drawing is much bigger, much bigger eye opener than a huge blockbuster event installation. There are maybe very similar situations small size estates are facing. We heard yesterday from Helen Vanderberger that her father turned his back towards the art world at a certain point. And there are many other, many, many reasons for artists uh, to, do, to, to have a non-career, let's say, that way. For example, women artists from the 50s and 60s especially, not having the career they related to the quality of their oeuvre. I, for example, represent a small estate of a zero artist, Hal Busse, who started <coughs> to exhibit with Pine, Mark Uecker, already in 1958. But then, after two years, she was not invited anymore, but worked her whole life. She never had a gallery, and the daughters ended up with a wonderful, wonderful group of artworks where I try to take care of now. So what are the possibilities of a small size estate to bring an artist back to the light? And I also realized huge difference between a living artist strategy and an estate strategy. We all know about um, the difficulties, the life, and the kind of happy end of artists like Louise Bourgeois, or one of my heroes, especially Carmen Herrera who has her first large retrospective now at the Whitney with 101 year. I just read a wonderful interview with her <clears throat> and I remember two fantastic quotes. First one was, fame doesn't change most of the people, didn't change me, but keeps you away from working. I think fame makes you very busy when you, have a, when you represent an estate. It's just the opposite. Also, when you <coughs> um, represent an estate, you need a very clear funding, a very clear business plan. When, uh, this is about money. So when Carmen Herrera was asked what she's doing with all the money, she took her fist, hit on the table and said, spending, spending, spending. Exactly the opposite again. 
So I hear, I hope we hear from our three representatives what are or what could be the strategies, what can be done, content, fund, and time-wise to run a successful artist estate. I'm very happy to introduce um, my three representatives, uh, Helen Vandenberger, Muan Tseng, and Mark Wu. I start with Helen. Helen was already introduced yesterday very nicely by Magda Salvesen, and um, she represents the estate of her father, <clears throat> but I'm a little bit more interested today in um, her engagement as an artistic advisor to the Center of Fine Arts in Brussels, and also the founding of the SOS Artistic Heritage Forum. Helen, please. So, hello. We talked about Picasso, Cezanne, Liechtenstein this morning. So let's talk now about some potential superstars. Um, I think we talked about yesterday, we said that every artist is different, so is every estate. But all estates have one thing in common. And that's the fact that on one side, you're dealing with heritage, and on the other side, you're dealing with work that's still active in a living art scene. So as an estate, you're sitting on two chairs, and it requires a lot of skills to manage an estate. So the next 10 minutes, I will give you an insight of how my two brothers and I are managing the estate of my father. As an estate, as our estate, we have three important tasks. The first task is to manage the heritage in the studio. The second task is to stimulate research. And the third task is to make the oeuvre accessible to the world. These are really the three core businesses of our estate. And at this moment, we have like eight to 10 projects, big projects a year. We work with a group of seven people together, and we have an annual budget of more or less 70,000 euros. So, when my father died, the first thing we did was to close the studio. We closed the studio and we stopped every sailing. So these are some images of the studio, how it was when my father died. And my two brothers and I, we really took the time to think to think and to talk. We talked a lot. We talked about what do we have to do? What can we do? What would our father have wanted? Do we have time? Do we have money? At that moment, as an art historian, I was working as a personal assistant of um, Paul Dujardin, the director of uh, Palais des Beaux-Arts in Brussels. My brother Mo is an architect, and my brother Guillaume is a filmmaker. So I decided to quit my job and to work, work full time for the estate. And my two brothers, they work between two projects that they have, so they're independent, and it's more or less actually a half time that they are doing. So I am the general manager of the estate. Guillaume um, is responsible for all the works and everything that's related to the photography of the works. And Mo, as an architect, he's responsible for the studio and everything that's related to architecture. So we talked a lot with each other, but we also talked a lot with other people. We talked about what can we do, but also about the quality of the work. So, because we needed to know if the work could stand in an international context. Because we realized as children that we were much too close to the work, much too subjective. Of course, for us, the work was the best work in the world. But we really needed to know, is the work good enough? And we, did, we needed to know where we stood before making our goals. So, after one year, we were, we were able to create our goal. And our main goal was really to keep the work of my father alive on international level. That was for us very important. So we talked about it. And at the end, we, or after two, three years, we decided to make a contract. So we made a contract. It's a civil partnership. It's a contract between several people 
how they will manage the capital that they share together. So it took us three years, and it's a 14-page contract. It seems a lot, three years, but also here, it took us a lot of time to think and to really to, to find the best solutions on some uh, problems. For example, one of the things that we decided was that we don't have an external board. So we talk and we listen a lot to specialists, but at the end, it's always us three who decides. So now we are working like this already some years, and I'm very happy that we decided that because it's really the best solution that we found. So while we were defining our goals, we had to make sure that the works in the studio were safe. So we had to change the studio from a workplace to a kind of depot presentation place. So Mo, he designed a complete new plan and we made all our boxes ourselves. And it took us also three, four years. It's really it's a huge work to do that. But now the studio is really a great place to invite people, to show them around. And, and all the works are safe. That's the most important thing. Also, my other brother, Guillaume, he photographed every single work in the studio and he described it. It was a huge work, again, but it's, it's great we have it because now we can work with all this information all the time. So, a second very important task for us is to stimulate research. And a good database is the basic for every research. So that means that you, not, you need to know all the works that the artist has made, so all the work that my father has made, and we call it the identity card of the work. So it's the history of the provenance, the history of the shows, all the technical details, the history of um, where the work has been mentioned in books and texts. And of course, it's a huge work. We're still working on it. But um, it's very important to do that. And it took us also a long time to find a good database, a structure, where to put it in. So we found a partner. It's a Belgian company, the name is Light Machine Agency, and they are developing for us a custom-made database system. It's a complete online system, and our website will be, uh, will be linked on it, on it also, so everything is linked, and also our website will be a kind of mirror from the inside, and we can decide what you can see and not. I show you here some images of the database, but for those who are interested in, I have the whole system with me on my computer, and I, you can come to ask me some questions afterwards. It will take too long to explain the whole database here. Of course, this database will be the basic for catalogue raisonné. It's very important. The archive. The archive is also very important to understand the work, to understand the context, the philosophy of the work. And in the studio, we had like this 20 meter of boxes of archives, and none of us had the courage to catalog it. Sometimes we took an archive at home, uh, a box at home, we went through it, but it was really, we realized very fast that it was work of a specialist. So, as we had a very good relationship with the library of the University of Ghent, we decided to donate the complete archive to the university. So, and in, re and in return, they have put an archivist on it, for one year and a half, who is now working to catalog the whole archive. And we also have a deal with the Department of the Art History that the students are working on the archive. So for us, it was a very important deal because first, we were sure that the archives were safe, in good condition. Second, that they were accessible to, any, to everybody all the time because it's a university library. And three, that researchers and students would work on it. Of course, if you decide to donate your archive to an institution, you have to make sure that you have a good contract. So, for example, with us, we made sure that the works were all, uh, that archives were always accessible for us. That, at the end, we have a complete digital copy of the whole archive because we have to work with it a lot. And three, that the copyrights maintained to the estate. Also something very, very important. Reinterpretation, we talked about it a little bit yesterday. For us, the reinterpretation is very important to keep the work alive. So we invite researchers to the studio, for example, and we talk about the work. 
And it's so interesting because every time again we do that, there are other things that comes out of the work. Like I said yesterday, I really think that every work, every strong work, can communicate with every context. It's only the conversation that will be different. So these meetings that result in, in projects and shows and books or in other research projects, it's really a never ending process because the context changes all the time. A third very important task for us is to make the earth accessible to the world. So I told you that in the beginning we decided to close the studio. Well, after three, four years, we decided to open the studio to public again. So we have a lot of groups of people who come to the studio, and we have a group of people who are interested, schools, a lot of schools, also children from all ages and older people, um, curators, collectors, artists. And it's really great to feel the synergy of the people from the outside and the works inside in the studio. Something that's also very interesting or important for us is that as an estate, we realized that we had a very big potential, uh, how, how would I say, a capital in knowledge, a potential capital in knowledge in the state. And that there's a lot of people who could be interested in it. So we work together with a lot of volunteers and schools who are interested in restoration, conservation, registration, students who want to learn about materials of way of paintings, drawings. And it's really a win-win because they come and they learn a lot in the studio and they help us for things that we don't not have the money or the, the power to, to develop it. So it's really a great way to work. Other artists. As my father was a real artist artist, other artists always have been very important for us. They really have been the best ambassadors for the state. It's them who brought us in contact with international curators, international galleries, with other artists. And it's really very important for us. We still work with them a lot. So, and it's funny because this working with artists, it started when my father died. They asked me, as I'm an art historian, to create a show. So I said, um, no, I'm too, I'm much, I, I think I, I told this yesterday, that I'm much too close to create a show, so I asked an artist, a good friend of mine, Berlinde de Bruyckere. I think you know her. She represented the Biennale last year for Belgium. She made this very huge tree. Well, she's a great artist. She came to the studio, and she, she ended up to create two shows of my father and a book. Later, we worked with other artists, as Koen van den Broek, Josanne Harrel, Thijs de Gruyter, Walter Swinne, Dirk Braakman. And it's really so great to work with artists because depending on what they're working on, they find new things in the work of my father. So it's also a very important thing to keep the work alive in the contemporary art scene. As we wanted to reach our goal, to keep the work of my father alive internationally, we realized that we had to bring the works out of the studio. So we had to do sales, we had to do shows, we had to do books. And we realized that we really needed a good, strong international gallery to do that. So we were very lucky to be brought in contact with our gallery, with Hauser and Wirt, who is now representing my father for four years. And they're really doing a great job, and they help us really on every level that we're doing. So these are Tom and Sylvia who are working with us. And um, it's a great, it's really a great pleasure and, um, to work with them. And then last but not least, as we are children of our generation, we work a lot with social media. So we have a Twitter, we have Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, we have a website. And for us, there are very important tools to reach a broad public. So not only the institutional art scene, but also the young people. Because at the end, it's these young people who will have to bring the work further in the world. So thank you for listening to my story. I, I just have one thing that I would say um, to finish my little story, and it's to 
all the estates, um, all the people who are carrying an estate, all the children, the families, the friends, and that's that they really, or you can really make a difference. It's really true. Thank you very much. Thank you, Helen. Fantastic. Muna, Muna Tseng is a famous choreographer and performer and artistic director of Muna Tseng Dance Project. But she also takes care of the estate, the photo estate of her brother, Tseng Pong Chi. An artist I remember even from the 80s, his uh, wonderful portraits of Keith Herring and Jean-Michel Basquiat, Andy Warhol, and many, many others. He was quite a figure in the New York art world. And um, I give the word to you now, more. Thank you, Loretta, for inviting me. It's an honor to be here to speak about my late brother Sen Kuang Chi's work. To understand the work and how to present it and how to tell the story of the artist has been my approach to building the legacy. I'll begin with um, some of his better known images and I'd like to speak in his words because the artist says it best. I am an inquisitive traveler, a witness of my time, and an ambiguous ambassador. After my American tour, I continued my project in Europe, in London first, where I had wonderful weather and met interesting fellows. <laughs> then I flew to France. I started my photographic career in Paris. Life in Europe is extremely attractive. And yet I settled in New York. I found there a suitable environment for my artistic journey. I began my East Meets West self-portrait series in 1979. I was inspired by President Nixon's visit to China in 1972. I found an antique Chinese official uniform and added my ID badge, which reads, Slut for Art. I used Chairman Mao's, Mao Zedong's official uniform as a signifier and persona. I am independent of myself. I want my presence to be both penetrating and withdrawn, confrontational and yet assimilative. My photographs are social studies and comments on Western society and its relationship with the East. My grand tour is a mythic pilgrimage. I confront both man-made monuments of power and the grandeur of nature by visiting familiar tourist sites. It is both universal and particular. Kuang Chi and I grew up in Hong Kong with a younger brother. In 1966, the family immigrated to Vancouver, Canada as the Cultural Revolution in China was spilling over into Brit British colonial Hong Kong. After an education in Canada, he studied painting at l'Académie Julienne in Paris, but quickly switched to photography. He joined me in New York in 1979, where I arrived to become a dancer. We lived in a fifth floor walk-up studio apartment in the East Village and later we shared a loft in Chelsea. Quan Chi viewed himself as a world citizen. He believed art is global. He was a Chinese American Canadian artist who brought East to the West and later West to the East. We like to bring consideration of his work beyond the medium of photography. Although his work embodies classical beauty as he was academy trained, he engaged with role-playing and pop art ideology of his time. He has been called Ansel Adams meets Cindy Sherman. 
Kong Chi was a staff photographer for the influential alternative paper Soho Weekly News, and he spawned several important socio-political projects. In 1980, Kuang Chi crashed Party of the Year at the Metropolitan Museum of New York as a reporter. It was celebrating Diane Freeland's Manchu Dragon Chinese Robes exhibition. Posing as the Chinese ambiguous ambassador, he photographed himself with the rich and powerful politicians, socialite celebrities and he sometimes exposed their ignorance and exoticizing of the East, as exemplified through Paloma Picasso's choice of Japanese robe. Upon Reagan's election, Kuang Chi drove down to Washington, D.C. with his friends, the artists Kenny Scharf and Bruno Schmidt, to photograph the ultra-right wing politicians who were rising to the zenith of their new conservative power. He placed a crumbled American flag as the backdrop and asked the very politicians who were opposing gay rights and AIDS research to pose candidly with this official reporter, poking fun at their pomposity without their knowledge. This was work that predates the social satire of Sasha Baron Cohen and Stephen Colbert. Before his death, Kuang Chi and I had long conversations about the major goals of creating a legacy. He wanted future generations to enjoy, view, and contemplate his work. He wanted to be acknowledged as a visionary and global artist of his time, along with his fellow artists and contemporaries. I'm touched to know that you remember his work from the 80s because he only worked for 10 years, 1979 to 1989. So it was a short time where he was more busy creating work rather than working on his reputation or career. Over the past 26 years, in order to get his work out in the world while developing the proper narrative to tell the story of this artist, I routinely ask, what would Quan Chi do? The foremost and central strategy I maintain is being true to the integrity of the work, thinking about its relevance and how it speaks to audiences now. A deep and fundamental understanding of the work and how to present it is paramount to building the legacy. Two years after his death, we did the first important exhibition at Houston Center for Photography in 1992 and in New York at the Alternative Museum. Julie Saul Gallery opened his first solo gallery show six years after his death in 1996. Recently, we worked with Paul Kassman Gallery in New York, Ben Brown Fine Arts in London and Hong Kong, and Eric Firestone Gallery in East Hampton. An estate archive is in a sense closed as no new images will be created. Nevertheless, we have to find ways to engage with the art market over time. And it's very important to do it in a consistent way and with integrity to build trust and reputation with galleries, the art market, and collectors. From the beginning, we have worked to place vintage prints which were made during his lifetime into museums and important collections. And we also established very strict controlled editions of posthumous or modern prints. They're limited and they are printed according to the artist's instructions before he died. And they maintain the same as artist standards and technology in silver gelatin and color C prints by the finest fine art printers and framers. I personally approve every print, hand sign and a state stamp each one. And we have designed and built an in-house database to keep track. We license our images regularly for editorial publications both paper and online, 
auction house catalogs, artist monographs, museums, and gallery catalogs. We have an extensive library of books, museum catalogs, academic textbooks and magazines that have published his photos. Am I going backwards? No, okay. Okay, great. We also have the world's largest archive of Keith Haring's work of approximately 30,000 images. He was a very close collaborative artist with Keith. They had parallel careers from 1979 to 1989, and they died within two weeks of each other. And being, we worked with the Keith Haring Foundation to share our archive and digitize it. But we have kept the copyright to all the photographs. We also have a comprehensive archive of his friends, good friends, Kenny Scharf, performance artist Anne Magnuson, as well as formal studio shots of major artists in the 1980s. We're in the process of working with MoMA Curators Museum of Modern Art in New York on a yet to be titled exhibition in 2017 on the art and performance scene of Club 57 in the East Village circa 1979 to 1981, which takes a close look at its creative social circle and its impact on the 1980s political climate. I'm very pleased that the, the solo museum exhibition, San Kuang Chi, performing for the camera, with over 85 works, is on tour right now. It was curated by Dr. Amy Brandt, the late Dr. Amy Brandt from the Chrysler Museum. And working with university museums as well as the Chrysler, it was really very interesting because a university museum can give you help with research, scholarship, as well as arrange many public talks and symposiums, all leading to better understanding of the work. So it opened at the Gray Art Gallery at New York University last year, and it has toured to the Chrysler Museum in Virginia and the Tufts University Art Museum in Boston, and it's opening Saturday at its fourth venue, the Block Museum in Chicago. It'll be up until December 11th if anyone goes to Chicago. Another upcoming exhibition we're thrilled about is called Gay Gotham, Art and Underground Culture of New York, opening at the Museum of the City of New York later this month. His work has now entered the artistic canon of the 20th century American history alongside of his contemporaries. We also maintain a digital presence through social media on our website, Facebook, and Instagram. These were um, started by the Chrysler Museum. Not to our knowledge, people just started doing hashtags, slut for art, and they started posing like him in front of um, monuments. So we were we find that young people are responding to his work in a world of selfies, and they calling him the grandfather of selfies. <laughs> we just worked with Uniqlo on some Keith Haring t-shirts. This is our first global commercial marketing venture, and it's done in the same spirit as Keith's Herring's own pop shop in the 1980s, which he had in New York and in Tokyo. I came to New York in 1978 to be a dancer. And as a choreographer and dancer, I've used his work and his life as my inspiration and subject. I made a dance theater work called Slut for Art. It was a collaboration with the theater director, Ping Chong, an homage to Quang Chi's art and his world from a sister to a brother. I performed both roles as Quang Chi and as myself. It was my way of 
processing grief to remember and to honor his spirit that lives on in me. I conclude by sharing a few lines by Ping Chong from Slut for Art. The things they share, an alliance at the altar of art, the full mystery of another. He was my idol, he was my guru. He was impossible, but I loved him. The things they share, the solace in art as a refuge from pain, the full mystery of another, the things we share. Thank you very much. Thank you, Muna. Mark, you are next with a quite impressive Vita, I have to say. I try to make it short. Um, board member of the Brighton Photo Biennale. He was also, also associate director of SUM. Organizing projects like Samsung Art Prize, commissioner for emerging art fairs like Art Guangzhou and the G Seoul 13, author two books, Come and Bubble Enter, Entender, curate solo and group shows, etc., etc. But especially, and that's what I'm very much interested in, the head of research and innovation of DAX. Um, DAX has a very informative website, and we hopefully will talk a little bit about it. Just two little quotes which I uh, took out from there. It says, uh, we collect and distribute royalties to visual artists and their estates. Since we were founded in 1984, we have paid over 75 million in royalties to artists and their estates. Now it's yours. Uh, brilliant, and thank you to Daniel Retter and the team who've been fantastic ho um, hosts for these uh, two days. So I hopefully won't keep you for too long, and um, we'll do some dancing and we're going to do some spinning on the chairs to, to end the day, so it's, it's all going to be beautiful. Um, but I am going to read now uh, some text and some slides are going to show, which are kind of related to what I speak about, but not totally wedded. Um, you'll see we are talking about women, um, because that's something in which, um, when we talk about kind of minor um, estates or small-scale estates, one of the questions obviously is what, what those definitions of major and minor are. And obviously, fundamentally, we understand them as financial, but it doesn't necessarily relate to the cultural value of those works. Um, what I would like to say is that the protocols of research in our era are very strange. We have access to an infinity of sources, but often find ourselves drawing together ideas from the spray of the net, contemplating the place of the artist within their legacy, inventories, and archives, led me briefly into the folds of Walter Benjamin's arch archive text by Verso in 2015. Without irony, that te text seems to me to be a cipher for what we have encountered so far with Art360. He kept meticulous notes of his daily reading in a leather-bound journal, of which, however, only a few pages now survive. The, the rest were lost as he uh, left uh, Germany. Um, however, what we do know is he had a very pragmatic and lucid understanding of how his legacy might be carried forward for future generations. And Benjamin says, disregarding the economic side of being a writer, I can say that for me, the few journals and small newspapers in which my work appears represent the anarchic structure of a private publishing house. The main objective of my promotional strategy, therefore, is to get everything I write, except for some diary entries, into print at all costs. And I can say that I've been fairly successful, knock on wood, for about four or five years. So as a curator, I think that that position of getting things out and distributed is really critical. And we're thinking about um, our relationship to the artist. Um, what we uh, 
do as curators is come into daily and direct contact with artists. And that is a very privileged space and a very important space. Any curator or collector or person who's shared time in an artist studio know that that is the whole key. You think you know an artist and then you open the door and you walk into that space and the whole world that you thought you knew is transformed. Um, however, often that is not something that we can uh, experience. And we have to acknowledge that artworks have a different life and a different type of life than the artist might have expected. They are cultural artifacts, but also a commodity asset. As the disciplines of art history and aesthetics were inspired by artworks of antiquity, Burkhardt published his masterwork, The Civilization of the Renaissance in Italy, whilst living in Basel, now a center of the contemporary art market. We should note in our margin that the double ledger of accountancy was first noted in the studio of Leonardo da Vinci. Today, knowledge of artworks is a commodity to be traded in its own right. Art Tactic, Artnet.com are just two of the traders in data and the indexes of art values. Following the lead of Benjamin, we can locate a logic that suggests that the legacy of artworks is intrinsically linked to their cultural and economic value. The maintenance of a legacy is also the consolidation of a market. We live in an era perhaps more informed by the implications of Benjamin's classic work, Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, published in 36 before he went into an exile. The volatility of the world in which artists create is likewise reflected in their legacy. Moving between political regimes or merely adapting in the face of escalating property markets, artists are forced to make decisions about what they keep and what they must distribute or destroy. And this question of what artists destroy and the meaning of that destruction is something that we have to keep returning to because that is fundamental in understanding what the role of the artist is certainly. Um, of course, increasingly, the di a digital shadow of their career exists online, which Benjamin Mayer found reassuring. Instead of the grand tour, we use um, uh, Google to orbit the cultural territory in which artworks have been made. However, we can quaintly suggest there is no substitute for directly experiencing this encounter with physical objects. And it is into that space, the artist's studio, whether that might be a purpose-built space or a room in a hotel with a laptop, that artists reveal the processes and complex considerations that prefigure the emergence of the artwork. Art360 is an action research project. It aims to understand the ways in which the contemporary artist or their heirs manage the diverse economies that inhabit this space of production and how the cultural and economic markets develop in relationship to their legacy. We believe that a living artist is uniquely positioned to dictate access to their work and what they hope for its future. Safeguarding the cultural heritage requires that the challenges of making and preserving work are openly explored. We are navigating a landscape that moves between piles of things to drop boxes full to I've no idea where that is. Um, it's, a, it, it's a set of uncanny challenges which sound domestic in many senses, but when they are in the context of an artist, we're moving towards the edge of the ordinary all of the time. As we've heard, I threw that away, it's in the bin, I press trash, may not have the same meaning for an artist. So that's... Each of the artists participating in the project is asked to respond to a questionnaire. And this is a baseline for the project on which an increasingly complex and nuanced consultation and qualitative information is built. We are asking artists to describe, in their own words, the inventory and storage systems they currently use and how they consolidate these. We are asking them what valuation of their works and archives has been commissioned so far and whether they have had any formal legal consultation. Um, this process we um, refined with a small group of artists, about five artists first, before we then made a public program. And so the public submission allowed any artist um, or a state based in the UK to apply for our program. We had 159 applications. Um, of those 159 applications, we selected 30 artists to work with. Now we're now working with 33. Um, the things that the artists um, that were selected um, experience is a continuation of that consultation around those questions where we go into depth around all the particular issues. Um, and those, those issues are often very, very complex. Lillian Lynn, who we've seen some images um, above us, uh, was a very early adapter to all the new technologies. So she worked very early within IBM. She had one of the first Macs. 
And the paradox of work in our era is the issue of reproductions demand that we consider interoperability between software architectures and legacy platforms. Issues common in daily life become complex when related to the aesthetics and provenance of works created digitally by artists. The obsolete mediums of the modern age make a very long list. As traditional idioms such as 16mm become vulnerable, the ways in which artists react to these questions has to be both pragmatic and conceptual. Art360 is a conversation with artists that allows them to remember and re-articulate the real issues and pressure on them to both maintain and create work simultaneously. Most artists have an inventory of sorts, but few have a technically integrated system. Location and status of their works may no longer be theirs and is often fraught. Owners are sometimes less diligent than the artist in terms of conservation. An artist's material are often unique or push the limits of performance. Therefore, it is not simply um, a question of who conserves the work, but how they can conserve the work. Um, the artists often create dyes and sketches, which have become increasingly integral to the understanding of those works. Increasingly, of far more complex works created by artists, they demand that you have installation instructions. And that can be from a simple installation of a neon on the wall through to how to uh, uh, install a software system to bring live CCTV feeds into a, into a work. The ways in which artists work is not something today we can easily um, assume future generations will understand. So in terms of the inventory and the legacy systems we develop, they have to be much, much, much denser. Um, and in terms of legacy, that means that we also have to look for expertise outside of our organization in, in terms of finding solutions, particularly those solutions around the digital and, and the operating systems the artists are working with. Art360 is a research proposition that the medium scale galleries and estates might survive collectively if we can understand the status of archives and inventories of a sample of living artists in small estates and ultimately help develop a policy to protect British soft cultural heritage. The life of the artist is always a life of complexities and their legacies is always a reflection of that. The question of a legacy that we must ask is whose artwork is it? Indeed, once produced, what privilege should an artist have? As Lynn explains, as an artist, you feel that you can always remake a work, but really you're copying it. I don't believe in linear time. The growth of demand for physical and digital images brings questions of security and potentially leads to the issues of licensing content as a means of sustaining a legacy, which returns us elliptically to the strange strategy deployed by Benjamin, the distribution as a way of creating an archive of his writings. The digital art workflows of artists are, of course, financially demanding. Keeping hardware so and softwares updated, sorting and storing photographs, sound files, and movie files demands that artists create sorry, uh, uh, create functional and flexible systems for access and sharing metadata and source materials. We also found artists already dealing with legacy strategies and in direct contact with major museums to negotiate. As Barbara Steveni candidly said, well, I am told that archives are hot shit now, but John and I did not do archives. This stuff of looking at artists and their archives, I have gone from drawing to walking. I have always been carrying a line. It's, it's in my notes, but often they are not legible. It's an assemblage. So how does an artist negotiate an assemblage of lines and collections? For some artists, of course, all this type of stuff is just the way of making new stuff for others. It can be a powerful research tool and indeed an important repository to understand their works within the community of artists. This certainly is the case of Franklin Rogers, Edward Woodman and Keith Piper, whose images we have also seen. They are nodes in networks that provide nets for art history. And again, with your brother's work, this interrelationship particularly between um, photography of intergenerational archiving. The, 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 we're in the mo era now, evidently we're all producing images, tweets, um, perpetual mediation. And, and that is a rich resource, but also a super complicated um, legacy to manage. Yeah. So, what does it take to help artists control their legacy? Our first steps suggest it perhaps demand that we understand that this is an issue they must and do take most seriously. We must allow artists to help us think through the materiality of being. 
I did the will and had a stiff cup of coffee afterwards, says, says Stavini, and then sipped a strong espresso. Legacy planning. She can dig that shit. Thank you. Wow, a lot of information. Thank you. So, um, what I read very carefully Helen's interview in uh, Loretta's book, which just which just was published, and um, I like very much because she gives a very clear outline and advice or describes the way how she and her brothers are working. So closing the studio, you repeat it here a little bit today, holding works together, even buying works back for the estate from different sources, uh, database, archiving, creating general strategy, conservation, research, presentation, sales, etc. Muna, did you have a similar kind of strategy or how did you start? Um, I would say that it was organic because I was a dancer. I did not know um, ab about the art world and so it was totally bewildering. But I think my brother trusted the fact that I was a performer and used to getting my work out into the world. Um, and um, so I think the strategy happened organically, like I said, um, and I was, I seeked out advice. And it was quite clear and very, um, to have the opportunity to speak with him about what he wished before he, he passed was amazing. Um, although he didn't plan out the strategy, he had a vision. And so my job was to honor that vision and figure out how to do it. So it took time. And it's labor of love because in the beginning, um, you know, no one else really would do it. And uh, often, a f um, to understand the work first was like my, my, my big task. And then figure out the strategy to do it and uh, bring guidance from professionals. Also depending on, on the feedback you get. I mean, you, you can't create everything by yourself. Eh? No, no. Yeah. But you, you, mentioned, you, you said something very important for me. We were talking about it before with Mark, that you discussed vision with your brother before he passed away. So my question to Mark is, don't you think that here and there it's a good idea that, I mean, even when it's very difficult for everybody of us to talk about our passing away, but don't you think that one or another estate work starts when the artist is still alive? I think that fundamentally our position is, is that that dialogue with the living, living artist is, which is, is the, the most um, efficient way of dealing with legacy because they are able to quickly identify um, the materials because they have a, a, a kind of sense of immediacy with it. As soon as you move out of that orbit, you move into something which is necessarily fragmented and broken and you're necessarily in the situation of oh Benjamin does amazing notes but we only have one page of it and so that sense of um, the the with Art360 all of the artists are interviewed all of them are filmed all of them are then um, given a shopping list of, of resources and we take them all through a process but all the way through it's about the artist dictating what they think is a priority based on a dialogue. And I think that that's, the, the, for us, the, the issue of immediacy and futurity is, is one that it has to start now because the velocity of change and mediation is just, a, it, that's, that's massive. And certainly, the, we, we are also dealing with some estates and 
the traction there is it's much slower. It's much, much slower. You work with lawyers also? I mean, you work in the same parallel with lawyers? Yes, yeah, so, uh, on, so basically on... what we've done is we've gone into consultation with um, the leading law firms in London mm. and we've told them what we're doing, the leading law firms in, in art and legacy mm. uh, strategy, and um, agreed with them very good um, rates for all of the artists involved in, in Art360. DAX was actually founded by artists, for artists, in, in 84, but with some support from lawyers. Lawyers have actually always been part of the supporting infrastructure around DAX. And our chair now is Mark Stevens, he's a leading um, art, arts lawyer, um, lawyer. And so from our point of view, that interrelationship evidently with the legal system in, in London was absolutely critical. And there's a reciprocity there because what we supply them is knowledge of what the issues are tomorrow. So they don't know how that they should deal with a, a, a work made on direct to 10. You know, that's, what is that? I, they never had to deal with it. So they need to know in advance whether that thing will have any value, etc. So there's a, there's, a, there's, a, yeah, there's a strong relationship there. Mm -hmm. Helen, <coughs> Helen, you um, I st still have this, this, um, this idea that you try to help me understanding a little bit from where you can get support for your for your estate work. I mean, you founded this SOS Artist Heritage Forum, as far as I understood. How does that work? Excuse me, what? You, you, you founded the SOS Heritage Forum. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, I founded forum. SOS Artistic Heritage, but that's uh, another project. It's with uh, um, Stella Lohaus. She's a daughter of a Belgian artist and um, Lohaus, Bernd Lohaus, and we started together a, a project because we realized that in Belgium there is no, inst no group or nobody actually where you can go to ask for information as a, as a daughter or as a family member or as an heir. So we started this SOS Artistic Courage, but that's, um, that's a project that I do next to the project of my father. And yeah, understood. Yeah. But it could be helpful for other it's, smaller estates. We think it's important that somewhere there's a center, an information center, where people can go and where they can have like an ABC, just what are the steps that you can do without, with, with, uh, without having a lot of money or time or um, resources. I think as an estate you can do already a lot of things without having all these um, things that looks amazing, like you need to have millions. It's not true. You can just do already a lot of things just on your own, but you have to know it. And you have, and that's, and that's, I think that would be, it's very uh, important that there's a center. I think the Institute is trying to do that also on an international level, but it's a project I'm, I'm working already three years on it with, uh, with Stella. And do you have a, a strong feedback and, and discussion with uh, um, or even cooperation work with uh, institutions and museums or yeah. is that something you had to build up or? For the SOS project for the, or no, for, for my the father? Estate, for the estate. Oh yes, for my father we had to start from zero. Hmm. We really had to start from zero and um, our way of working is what I mentioned, that we have a capital of knowledge, maybe not a capital in money-wise, money but in knowledge and work. And there's a whole outside world who is interested in it. So we really work with this principle of win-win. How can we share? How can we help each other? And um, yeah, that's the way how we work. So we work with museums, with archives, with other artists, with schools, with universities. We really work a lot together. We make bridges, actually. That's the way. Mm -hmm. no, I, I <coughs> just uh, know from my own work and from my little estate I'm taking care of that um, especially the funding to keep the work alive, you know, to, you, know, you have a lot of costs, is, um, is a huge 
issue usually. I mean, we obviously have two daughters to deal with, so we are discussing it all the time. And, um, but besides, do you see any possibilities to, uh, for funding besides of selling works? We fund ourselves 100% in selling works. Yeah, that's but what we do. We are working now, I hope, with Flemish government to, at this moment, I don't know, internationally, but in Belgium, as an artist, you can ask for money for a show or for a book. And we hope that they will open it, that they won't make the this um, the unterschied, the a difference between a living artist and that artist. That's something that we are working now on. Because we have a lot of shows also. I have to go to Brazil and I have to go to Cuba for a project, but I cannot ask for money. But it's also for, for the artist, actually. So that's a, that's a thing that we are working on now. Muna, you're the same, or? Um, I, I think it's, um, it, when Quan Chi died, there was very little cash left. And uh, like Helen said, the capital is in the work and in the knowledge. And um, it was tempting to start selling off work. Uh, we didn't do it until 1996 to start working with a gallery. And um, also, I think that it, it was, uh, we, ha we had a, a very good gallery who um, ha placed works in museums and public institutions, but we had this um, issue of posthumous or modern editions. Now, photography is perhaps a little different from um, unique artwork, but the modern editions, you know, I still get people saying, oh, you know, modern editions. But he, he worked um, only for 10 years. He did not print out his editions. And so um, we had to make that decision. And he did say he wanted the modern editions to happen. Mm. Otherwise, many of his images would not exist in the world now. And, um, and then also the whole licensing of the copyright. I must say, I didn't really understand copyright as such a valuable asset that you must control. And um, at first we worked with Artist Rights Society that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, but we took back uh, licensing in-house a few years ago because we found that um, Every request for his image to appear, whether it's in a magazine or it's by a PhD scholar wanting to use it in a lecture, every use is different. And so you cannot, we do spend a lot of time like addressing every use. And sometimes we give the images free, sometimes we charge. If it's an auction house, Sotheby's call, we charge. <laughs> So, uh, you know, and we cannot afford to, um, to give away all our images because we're a small organization and that's one stream of uh, revenue hmm. to keep the activities going. Um, and so I think there is a danger of like letting work out too fast, especially before we start a database. Um, we started working with galleries and the works, you know, went out into the world and then we kind of like, oh, wow. But at least with photographs, you can addition them, the numbering system and whatnot. But all of that has to be very consistent and thought out. How, how many people you have helping you? Or? One full time, moi, <laughs> um, and we bring on projects, each project we bring on okay. staff. Okay, I see the microphone, so we open the discussion to the public, please. Can I just, can I just say something? Mark, about... one last word. Yeah, because <laughs> I, I think in relationship to funding in the UK, we are in a very lucky position in some senses. Despite austerity funding for Art360, we were able to go to um, the Henry Moore Foundation, the Arts Council, the Arts Fund, and the National Archives, 
um, and discuss the ambitions for the project and essentially make this conversation happen around the kind of notion of soft cultural heritage. So the British government quite openly now talks about soft power. Um, our sense is you don't have any soft power if you have no assets and actually you need public and private investment to ensure that those assets don't disappear. So we actually raised, I mean, we've raised uh, a, you know, about 400,000 pounds to date and still um, raising money for our project. And that allows us to give money directly to artists mm -hmm. to do the work necessary to kickstart a, 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 a legacy management strategy. But we're lucky in that Wonderful. Yeah. Any questions? Hi, um, I have a question. It's um, uh, for Hélène, uh, and it's then more general. But from what you were saying, that <clears throat> you close the studio, and then for a few years, you decide what's going to happen. Who is controlling what's happening when you close the studio? Because it's, then it's a family affair. You can put works aside, you can even create works and then will be in it. I don't know, like anything can happen. Um, so who is the oh. authority of control? Well, we closed the studio, but we closed also all collaboration with galleries. Or there was a show that was, go was planned, we, sh we closed it. So there was nothing coming out from the studio anymore. Of course, there's an outside world, there are, there are auctions, you cannot control that, but um, there's, yeah, you cannot control everything, of course not. But we controlled everything that came out from the studio. But control is a center word. Pardon? I hear it all the time, control yeah. is a very center word, uh -huh. right? Yeah. In a positive way. Yeah, no, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, is this the... Hi, I'm Kim from Fondation Constant, and I was wondering, I saw your social media accounts, and I was wondering, do you put the works on there? Because I know it gets really tricky, like, yes, from there. Like, do you put full works on there? Yeah. S okay. We are very open to share um, right. the works. It's a decision that we made. Uh, we talked about it yesterday also a bit. I think if you want to find the works anyway, you can find them on the internet. So I prefer to provide them good images yeah. and uh, with in, uh, good resolution. But yeah. I'm for open for sharing things. But you do uh, you do have a copy copyright man uh, like organization that does that for you, or you do that yourself? No, in Belgium we have a copyright uh, organization. It's I think it's from the government. Uh, anyway, it's controlled by the government, and we are a member of it. Okay. And they control it also. Yeah, so when the images get used for commercial purposes, even though you put them online, then yeah. you would still get the... Yeah, okay. that's right. <laughs> um, Nicholas Dolavera, Montabalan Partners, and LMU in Whitechapel. Um, I was... I was very taken by um, some, of the, some of the words that we heard, but I, I think some of the words are much more proactive and other words are much more kind of reactive. What I mean by that is a sort of conceptual problem that resides somewhere between the past and the present and that an awful lot of effort is actually placed towards the, the, trying, the hard scrabble acts of the past, that is to say, that the past is forever giving, it never finishes giving, and we're obsessed with it because there's always more information. I mean, earlier on we were talking about the digital age, and the digital age, there's always more things that we can record and find. So the past is, is forever bringing up further things because, of course, we live in it. We are the living proof of the past, so it's endless. What I'm interested in is this transition that happens somewhere along the line between the past and the present. And it struck me very particularly with these, with these three presentations here, there's a very strong link that each one of you actually individually makes. And I think that there comes a point at which 
intervention and invention and myth-making actually become part of this. I was very struck by um, the, wonderful, the wonderful work of um, Edward Woodman, which of course you mentioned, and I worked with Edward Woodman as an employer for years, and I know that he talked about the flattening effect of images, of installations and such. And he would always say that it's very important to have this idea of a record. And the problem is that the idea of a record is never enough. And I was wondering, particularly for Mark now, how, how this idea of recording the past is actually going to help artists in the present and direct them towards the future. Yeah, I mean, I think that fundamentally, the question that we're trying to engage with is what is the contemporary workflow in the studio? And in that workflow, can there be efficiencies introduced into the immediate present which do the legacy work in the present? And the sense is that if you're a busy artist, those workflows are essential. It's exactly the same stuff. It's getting the images out with the right metadata attached to it. it all of the administration that, that you require, if you're working with four galleries in different continents, you need to be efficient. You can't be messy in that sense. So, or if you want to be messy, you're going to have to have a lot of clean people behind you. And so that is the sense. It's the affirmation that it's a style of working in the contemporary which needs to change in order to free artists up to make work so they don't feel burdened by something that they have to at some point switch off and go, okay, I'm not going to make any more work, I'm just going to deal with my past. And you're absolutely right. To allow them to remain in the present and active um, for as long as they want to make work, that is the ambition. And, but also to come up with um, uh, ways in which by doing that they also make more money. And particularly, obviously, from our point of view, the question about copyright, what we're seeing with Edward Woodman, for example, after his accident, he had um, not much resource and not much attention. And basically, we've been able to help him go through his archives, digitize them. And this is, this is the documentation of a generation of British artists that has just been in boxes and untouched. It's, it's a crazy valuable legacy that many of the artists we're engaging with have, but they haven't had the time or the system or the advice to monetize that cultural capital. We close the panel. Yeah. We are a little bit yeah, later than we thought. Yes. Well, thank yeah. you for so much. I think this is a topic we could go on discussing among each other for hours. But we've come to an end. <laughs> and um, I think Daniel, Carl, Miriam, Leticia, and myself can only thank every one of you, the speakers, but also the audience, for your terrific contributions. And I think we have had extremely um, inspiring two days. And we are quite encouraged to continue these conferences. I think we will be doing them on a biannual basis. We will be going on next year with offering more in-depth workshops where we might, among you, among others, get together in the circle of 2025. We will be offering workshops to work more in depth with many of the topics we touched today. And I think we are all agree that there's a lot to look into. And in case you need any advice or help with your um, estates in the meanwhile, feel free to call. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.